Thanks a lot for the great introduction, very comprehensive. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk to you today. I'll be talking a bit more on the technical front uh, about artificial intelligence. How many of you have uh, gone through or read an article about AI? How many of you have? How many of you have gone through a MOOC? Okay. How many of you are using or teaching AI today? Just one hand. That's very interesting. That is also approximately how much AI is being used in industry today as well. There's a lot of awareness about it, right? But the actual adoption of AI is very, very small. So let's talk a bit about that. I'll get into are you ready for AI? And is AI ready for you? So I was sitting last evening and thinking about AI and thinking about, okay, what's my keynote for today? Ask Alexa to, to write it for me. Of course, not surprisingly, you know, that didn't work so well. And we know that because general artificial intelligence, for example, if it ever comes to write a talk like this, is many decades away. Thank God. What AI can actually be used for today is more narrow, specific uh, uh, tasks. So we can just ask Alexa, for example, just to play some music while I have to sit down and write the talk myself. We see AI being used across many, many different uh, applications. For example, of course, such uh, uh, smart speakers in facial recognition, in uh, machine translation, or also in automated driving. But I'll talk a bit about how AI can be used for more um, specific applications, probably closer to what we are doing as engineers and scientists today. For example, in food technology or uh, food uh, quality control. We had a question, or we had a, uh, it was mentioned how would AI be used, for example, in mechanical or civil engineering. So we have an example uh, in uh, from civil engineering. Or in developing wind turbines or in making complex dynamic systems like this robot learn how to walk in a straight line. So let's get down to it. Firstly, I'll define what is AI. AI, as we def define it from a technical perspective today, is the capabil capability of a machine to match or exceed intelligent human behavior by training that machine to learn that desired behavior. So what do I mean by that? There are two ways to get a computer to do what you'd like it to do. The traditional approach, where we have data and we write a program that then processes that data and gives us the desired output. Using a technique called machine learning, this flips it up. We give the data to the computer as well as the desired output. The computer trains a model, in this case, creates a program that then we can use to process further data and give us that desired output. Now it's not fair to call this, call this thing that the computer creates a program, it's a model. That's why I said trains a model. And oftentimes these terms are used interchangeably. AI, machine learning. So machine learning is a technique, for example, within AI. There are other techniques as well, deep learning, for example, also, and I'll talk about, a bit about that. So let's take a look at this. Now, if we have data, a model, and output, do we have everything that we need to implement our AI? Probably not completely, and I'll give you an example. For example, let's take an automated driving application, a simple application like, let's say, a lane assist feature which pushes you back into the lane if you're leaving uh, if, if the if the vehicle figures out that you're leaving that lane of course in india we're always leaving the lane so i don't know how often that will actually work but let's hypothetically think that you know we have great traffic and we're driving down that lane now what does this this uh, feature require you to do one part of it is what we call the lane 
departure warning system or the lane, or actually the lane uh, uh, recognition system, which then takes data from various different sensors, for example, cameras, radar, lidar, combines that data, and then uh, gives the system an, uh, uh, a, a, a basically a recognition that we're departing from that lane. There's a lot more that happens in the vehicle. <laughs> So let's take a look at that. The vehicle has to first, we have to access all the data, we have to analyze the data, we have to develop an algorithm that actually works with this data, and we have to deploy it. And when we look at that, what's missing for such an application? If we just look at the model, it's everything else. The AI model is just one part of what we're doing. And we have to develop that AI model, but it has to work essentially with everything else. With the rest of the algorithm, for example, the control algorithm that actually steers the vehicle back, it has to also be tested, modeled, simulated, etc. in its environment. And then we look at accessing all the data from various different sensors, and when we're developing it, we don't have the sensors, we actually have the data and files, we've got to access all of that, we've got to analyze it, explore it, understand what kind of algorithms we're going to use, and then think about where we're going to actually deploy this application. So to make AI work, you actually have to make the whole system work. And that is where we're coming from. Essentially that engineers and scientists use tools or methodologies to, to develop these systems and we want to make it easy for engineers and scientists to also use AI as one part of what they're doing. Think of it as a toolkit and enable you to use AI as part of your toolkit to develop the system that you require. So let's take a look at this. First, see, the first question that you need to answer for yourself is do you need AI? Here's an example of a robot on an assembly line picking up an object and putting it in another place. Does this kind of a control system or does this kind of a robot require AI? Probably not because you can define all the movements of the system clearly just using traditional control techniques. But if you think about an assembly line and we think about all the different robots working on that assembly line and we want to figure out a way of actually predicting when one of these robots would fail because if it fails it will stop the whole assembly line. This is a system that has a high amount of variability and a lot of uncertainty. Each robot may wear at a different rate depending on the task that they're actually carrying out. This is probably an application where we could use AI. So, how about if you never use machine learning? So, are you ready for AI if you've not used any machine learning? Here's an example, as I mentioned earlier, from the snack food industry, um, where they're trying to figure out or uh, understand the quality of the of the snack. Is it is it fresh or is it not fresh? And surprisingly, this is more complicated than one would think. The scientist uh, actually uh, uh, used feature extraction techniques to understand what's the crispiness of the snack and what's the crushing force on the snack, and then used professional tasters to figure out or to 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 be able to analyze or to be able to classify. Is the snack crispy or soggy? In such a case, the scientists had never used uh, AI or machine learning techniques before. So get all the features out, and then the next step in, in, in developing an AI or a machine learning algorithm is to classify. So if you've not used classification, you can use something like an app that helps you through this process. Do you try out all the different algorithms that you have, all the different classification algorithms? Or you can also let the app figure out which one is the right one for you. So in this case, you pull in all the data that you require, run various different classification algorithms across all the data, for the data that you require that you've chosen for testing, and then you get an accuracy, for example, here of each classification algorithm. You can drill in deeper to then understand how is each classifier working for your specific application. In this case, there's a, this is what's known as a confusion matrix. This actually uh, shows the, the, the classified or the class 
or one of the test vectors that you've built that you've given against what was the actual true class. So what is the prediction versus the, 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 the reality. And with this, you can understand how well your application is working. So tools like this help you understand and help you also adopt AI techniques. I talked about features. Now, what if you can't identify features in your data? This happens oftentimes, especially in, 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 in computer vision, for example. Also sometimes feature extraction can be very complicated. It can take a lot of time. So we can use a technique called deep learning. Now, deep learning requires you to have a lot of data to first train your algorithm. And this is a case that was used, for example, in, Mecata, in, in the civil engineering uh, uh, application. There is a technique uh, for drilling a tunnel known as a new Austrian method. And this essentially requires a geologist to come on site to look at the face of the tunnel while drilling to then uh, analyze uh, how, how the drilling can be done. I'm not a civil engineer, but this is the this is at a high level what was happening there. So if civil engineers are there, you may have you may have more insight into this technique. The problem with this is geologists spend a lot of time looking at this each site. They can take hours to analyze this. There's a shortage of such people. So can could they use deep learning, for example, to do this analysis? And on-site evaluators can actually then decide with the support from the deep learning algorithm on how to drill. And this was done uh, the, using a set of images from the site, but also using a technique called transfer learning, where you have an actual pre-trained network, which you can then customize to then actually understand how or, or develop your own uh, prediction. In this case, this was then also um, exported or uh, uh, deployed onto an iPad, for example, which then uh, uh, the, the on-site engineers could use uh, uh, directly. So if you can't identify the features, you can use deep learning techniques. And here's just a very quick example of how you can use deep learning within, or how you can implement deep learning within just five lines of code. Right? We, we can identify various different objects. This is by taking an existing deep learning network and just running the inference over there. Uh, I typically would not ask everybody to take out phones, but if you want to learn more about this, take out a phone and take a snap of this QR code. Uh, this is a, uh, an, uh, an on-ramp training. It's a two-hour training that you can actually go through directly uh, on, on the web. And you can learn how to use MATLAB for deep learning. Another great example of usage of mobile phones, mobile technology today. I'll move on. Uh, if, you, if, 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 you, if, if you want to have, uh, if you've not have, had a chance to take this photograph, just come back and take it off. What if you don't have the right amount of data? or the right data. What's an application of that? Failures. So any wind farm operator will not like to see this. Right. Um, essentially, how can you predict that your machine is going to fail? To be able to predict that, you've got to train your machine learning or AI algorithm with failure data. Where do you get that failure data from? That's expensive and typically, at this point in time, you're not actually extracting data from your from your asset. So if you want to if you want to develop something like this, in addition to your to actually having having your you know your system, you normally also have a model that you use to develop something like a a, a wind turbine. We can use simulate to develop such models. And you can fine tune these models so that they they act just like the models on the field. Oftentimes, is known as the digital twin. So we take measured data from the field and refine our model. We can then inject failures into that model to then extract the failure data 
with which we can then train our deep learning or machine learning algorithm to then predict future failures. Right? So this is a case where you don't have data in, 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 many, in many cases you, you can't find the data. I'll move on. What if you need to develop a trial and error? What's an application of this? As I mentioned earlier, a complex dynamic control system, uh, for example a robot like this, can be taught how to walk in a straight line through trial and error. And essentially, the, 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 this, this is a technique known as reinforcement learning in which good behavior is rewarded. Running this on hardware or to actual physical prototypes, you can think of this, is expensive and oftentimes uh, impossible. In cases like this, where we, we may not have this data, we actually generate this data using simulation based techniques. We design a scenario and run multiple simulations, hundreds of thousands of simulations, to then design the algorithm that will actually control our system. And the end result could be something like this, where the robot is actually then trained to walk on the straight line. So how do you feel? Are you ready now a bit for AI? So how are you ready to teach AI? Earlier, uh, one of the speakers talked about you know classrooms today, and I think we've come some far, some way away from from these kind of classrooms. Uh, mostly now, students learn through experiences, through online uh, resources, and collaboratively. And using MATLAB and similar, we have a lot of capabilities that enable this kind of learning. Um, one thing that I like to talk about briefly is we've got many institutes now on a campus-wide license where everybody across the institute has access to MATLAB, Simulink and all our tools um, and this can be installed on student computers, uh, faculty computers, lab computers, etc. Unlimited is so to say. So if everyone has, 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 has MATLAB or Simulink you can actually then uh, teach some of these technologies or techniques or capabilities Oftentimes, because these need a high amount of computing power and um, uh, and, 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 and and the ability to run simulations. I just uh, one more thing that I'd, I'd like to just um, uh, hit upon is uh, MATLAB is one of the fastest growing skills for new for graduates. This was uh, taken from a study from LinkedIn analyzing the top 50 employers in the US. And this set of employers over here, they found MATLAB is one of the fastest growing skills that they require for their students to, for their fresh graduates, uh, uh, when, they, when they're looking at fresh graduates joining their, uh, their institutes. So now coming back to this, the right side is gone. Product, probably predictive maintenance would help over here, analytics. Uh, as I mentioned, AI is one part of the toolkit of what you require to develop systems. It is becoming more and more ubiquitous today. Uh, more and more applications are using AI, probably because the complexity and the variability of these applications is increasing. And traditional first principles approaches cannot help us in developing these applications. We have to go to data driven techniques. And with MATLAB and Simulink, you can do both. You can go first principles, you can develop your applications traditionally as well as use data-driven methodologies uh, in conjunction. With that, briefly, how can you get started? There's a MATLAB on ramp, which is a, a two-hour free training on MATLAB that anybody can go to. The Simulink on ramp to learn how to model and uh, simulate dynamic systems, and as I mentioned earlier, the deep learning on ramp as well. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, coming to Guwahati. A pleasure talking to you.